Hey FishTube and Happy New Year! Steven here. I've been meaning to make a video on this display tank just to provide another update. I did a tank tour of this aquarium, my first ever edited video, just over a year ago. It's a 40 breeder with assorted Australian rainbows, Melanotania maculicae, an angelfish, some rosy tetras, zebra loaches that hide all the time, some bronze Corydoras, Autosynclus, and a couple of bristlenose plecos. We've got two Fluval 3.0 lights and CO2 injection blasting the heck out of some live plants. The plants are a combination of easy to medium difficulty plants like Dwarf Sagittaria, Bacopa Caroliniana, Ludwigia ovalis, Tiger Lotus, Hygrophila corymbosa compacta, Red Sword, Java Moss, Regular Baby Tears, and Rotala rotundifolia. None of which really require a whole lot of light to do okay in a tank, and they definitely don't need CO2. But then I have a few on the more difficult side. Not necessarily all of them demanding CO2, but sometimes finicky with water parameters and lighting level. Like the S. Repens, Monte Carlo, Limnophila aromatica, Rotala wallichii, Rotala macrandra big leaf, alternate Ninthera renechii in Lilacina, Ludwigia super red, Ludwigia inclinata, yeah, tons of stem plants. Now here's the problem. Down here on the dwarf sage, the rocks, the s repens, and some of the leaves on the slower growing stems, we have various algae, mostly blackbeard and some clodophora. Now CO2, it's amazing stuff, and so is a good light spectrum. For the most part, it makes the plants happy and hungry. The CO2 increases the plant's ability to photosynthesize, aka use more light, and light increases the plant's ability to use more food. But it's not just good for plants, algae loves it too, and it's more than happy to jump in and take advantage of the excess nutrients in light. The source of excess nutrients in this case is pretty obvious. This is a heavily stocked tank with some big hungry fellas like these rainbows and the corridoras. And if you notice, whenever you see a high-tech aquascape, like those beautiful award-winning scapes with CO2 injection, high light, colorful plants, and of course no algae at all. Basically a 10 minute ad for Kessel or the like. They all seem to have one thing in common, and that is they are understocked to the point that the fish are negligible bioload. That's why the EI method or the estimative index method of fertilizer dosing is what a lot of aquatic plant enthusiasts use. The idea is to add a consistent amount of nutrients at intervals throughout the week followed by a larger water change to reset the nutrient levels in the tank before algae has a chance to take hold. The goal here is to maintain complete control of the nutrients in your water column which is best done with fertilizer that you add rather than the variables introduced by a bunch of fish food particles and fish waste. But you know what? F*** that. I'm not going to choose between my fancy plants and my big derpy fish, and that means I have to find a balance in some other way, and it may end up that I have to make compromises with some of these more finicky light hungry plants and turn the light down some, and at best, with what I'm trying to achieve, I may just have to accept some amount of algae. But this blackbeard algae doesn't need to be here in this abundance, so what do we do about it? First, let's look at what causes blackbeard algae specifically. Blackbeard algae seems to thrive when there's a lot of debris, like detritus and uneaten decaying fish food, in areas where there's either no plant growth or slower growth or at least not enough growth to use the excess nutrients that comes from that waste. It doesn't take a keen eye to see we're dealing with an overfeeding issue. Snails are always a great barometer for how much waste is sitting around in your aquarium. If there's plenty of excess food available, you'll see plenty of excess snails. And there's quite an influx of Malaysian trumpet snails here that pretty much tells you there's stuff to eat in here. The biggest mistake I've made is trying to treat this tank like my lower tech tanks with live bears and shrimp and uh, not do much gravel vacuuming or general cleaning of the plants. But live bearers and shrimp are much better cleaners than scavengers in all the nooks and crannies, whereas these big fish are not gonna do that kind of cleaning. Otherwise, I mean, all of this organic debris is like having little pieces of root tabs sitting on your leaves and on top of your substrate, all the places you don't want them to be. And when you've created this kind of environment for plant growth, it is far from natural. 
And that's something you gotta accept and be willing to put in the work to keep it clean. The other cause of blackbeard algae, in combination with the excess organic waste, is low or fluctuating or inconsistent amounts of CO2. And that was another issue I dealt with a few weeks ago because I wasn't paying as much attention as I usually do to this tank. There was a leak in the regulator due to a faulty O-ring, so my cylinder ran out of CO2 very quickly and there was at least a full week of no CO2 and I didn't even notice it. And going from full CO2 to none in such a short period of time is a fast track to algae problems. It's like quitting a hard drug cold turkey and getting serious rebound symptoms. So now the leak is fixed, the CO2 is going again, but this algae has taken over a little too much. Now for the plan of attack. We're going to try removal and addressing the underlying problem at the same time. First thing, this dwarf sag can just be trimmed down to the substrate and it'll come back. Now when I do this, I need to be extra careful about keeping this area clean from excess debris so that the dwarf sag has an opportunity to come back before more algae can take over. Since this dwarf sag is stressed right now, it'll need some time to recover and start sprouting leaves again. And that is the opportune time for algae to swoop in. Second thing, daily water changes for a little while, maybe a week, just to vacuum out some of the debris. A turkey baster helps blast some of that detritus loose from the dense vegetation and moss. I don't plan on digging down in the gravel, but it is important I clean the surfaces of plants and decor now and thoroughly, and then make a habit of doing it at every future water change, which is roughly once a week. The other thing I'm going to do is try to kill some of the excess algae on rocks and leaves. I take a pretty conservative approach here, about 20 milliliters of 3% hydrogen peroxide on targeted areas while the filter is off. One treatment isn't going to cut it, so I intend to do it at least once a day for a while. I'm hoping that by the time I'm done killing the algae and cleaning the tank, I'll have reached a point where I'm set up to prevent most of it from coming back. So I hope this initial video helps you understand the role CO2 plays in the aquarium and the importance of consistency, but I'm still enjoying the full fast growth and beauty it brings to some of my planted tanks and this is all still just a big fun experiment for me. If you want to follow along with the progress of fixing this tank and everything else I'm doing in the fish room, don't forget to subscribe. Thanks, and I'll see you later.